Hello everybody, I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions, a program that provides scriptural insights on your questions about life. It seems these days that life takes so many twists and turns, we can't make it without God's perspective on life. Well, we have received a lot of your viewer questions about life and we are joined by a group of local pastors today who have been digging into the Word of God for answers to share with you and they are here to do just that, to share those answers. I want you to meet them. First up we have Pastor, D, uh, Pastor Neil Whitney of the church at Allentown, followed by Pastor Tyler Perry of Anastasis Church here in Lima. And there's, there's Pastor John Hayward of Grace Community Church, also of Lima. And rounding off our panel for today is Pastor Rick Lamb of Hume United Methodist Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all with us today. Thanks. And as you can see, I'm armed with a great number of questions here that viewers are just sitting on the edge of their seats, <laughs> waiting to glean from the wisdom, the pearls <laughs> of wisdom as they drip from your lips, okay? <laughs> the first one here, TV44 viewers are continually sharing concerns about the economy. It says they voice a distrust in the government as well as concerns over prices continuing to increase. Uh, as pastors, can you provide an encouraging word or even financial suggestions on how to get through these difficult times? Mm -hmm. Pastor Hayward, do you want to start us off, sure, please? Sure. The Bible has a lot to say about money. Mm -hmm. And in terms of encouragement, I think the most encouraging verse that I can think of, I've, I say to tell people, it's put me to sleep many times when I've been worried and anxious. <laughs> I've, I've meditated on these uh, uh, words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he says in Matthew chapter 6, don't be anxious saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Non-Christians seek after these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. So Jesus tells us, don't, don't worry, don't fret, don't worry about the government, what they're going to do or not do. Look to your heavenly Father, seek His kingdom, and He's going to take care of you. Now, that doesn't mean we become passive and we don't make any plans mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. our money. Uh, I think as we were chatting beforehand, we were all saying one of the really important things that people can do is make a budget and stick to it and don't live beyond your means. Uh, and the Bible has some really positive things to say about money. Mm -hmm. uh, Proverbs uh, ten fifteen says, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty, the poor is their ruin. So to have some money in the bank, for when the you know transmission goes out or the plumbing you know some plumbing issue, and you just go write a check, that's a really smart thing to do. So in terms of encouragement, I would look at something like Matthew chapter six. In terms of practical suggestions, I'd say you know set a budget, live within your means, have an emergency fund, yeah. and that and that that brings a lot of uh, of uh, assurance. You know, I was a financial advisor for um, over two decades. Um, before well, you should retirement. be answering this question then. Well, <laughs> you're, you're right in that that the Bible speaks to money about 2,300 times. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and a lot of times the problem we're having is that we're just not following biblical principles. Would you say that? Who can add to that? Is, is it a case where we're not following biblical principles that many times leads to the financial problems that we have? Absolutely. That's the easy answer to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Matthew chapter 6 goes on to say, give, pray, and fast. That's the completion of uh -huh. what John was talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Where so, you fix your eyes matters. Sorry, keep going. Where, where you fix your eyes matter. Yeah. Excellent. Think. I mean, if we if we're fixing our eyes on the government, thinking like that is where we need to place our trust, mm -hmm. or that's going to be the end all, be all to our situation, we're missing the fact that even in, you know if we look at James, he says if you're if you need wisdom, ask God for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Don't look to the world for wisdom. Don't look at everything going around you for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom, and He'll give it to you. He wants to give it to you. Yeah, and so, mm -hmm. in, in turbulent times like this, and what could potentially be coming, it's it is easy for us to submit to fear and say wow, everything around me looks really, really bad. But there's always this opportunity for us to say, God, help me get my perspective, right? That seek first the kingdom of God, let him add everything to you. Ask him for wisdom, he will give it to you. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of self-discipline to sound mind. Mm -hmm. He's given, he's equipped you with what you need as you seek him to make it through these times as well. And as Pastor Hayward was saying, starting off the program, that there are practical things that we need to be doing ourselves mm -hmm. in addition to pursuing God for wisdom. Like um, if we're not saving for retirement, but we do intend to retire someday, we're gonna be in deep trouble mm -hmm. if in fact we don't get mm -hmm. at it, huh? Yep. Yep. And if yep. we haven't started already, some of us are already there, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
And so, yeah, it's important for us to be able to address that issue earlier in life when, when we think we're going to live forever and uh, we, we'll always be able to earn a living. And, uh, and so we don't really put ourselves to saving or, or socking some away for, you know, the rainy day or whatever, like you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. uh, car transmission goes out or what. I, I think prayer is an important com component. Neil mentioned it uh, as he was going through the list. And I'm reminded in Daniel how that uh, Daniel asked, the, he called out to the Lord and prayed and asked him for an answer regarding Nebuchadnezzar. And, and God answered his prayer. And I think that, uh, you know, when we're in a circumstance, sure, we need to be without any anxiety. We need to be uh, trusting God for all things, but we can also pray and ask him for guidance in how to, uh, uh, how to proceed and ask him to provide our needs and um, and and when it says needs it doesn't mean oh yeah the the creature comforts that I'm used to. <laughs> have, have any of you seen any of the polls that have come out particularly in today's economy? I mean the the um, as we leading up to the uh, November elections it seems that the economy is going to be a big issue and people are finding it quite difficult to get over, you know, I, I know there, there are jobs out there, yeah. but there just still seems to In be fact, a lot of. They said uh, the other day on the radio that there are twice as many jobs as there are unemployed people. Yeah, yeah. Which makes you wonder how come then we still have people on the highway exits with these signs up, you know, we'll work for money and, you know, and, and behind, if you look behind them, there'll be a job, a, a, a sign over that says, we're hiring, yeah. we're hiring. Yeah. And, Mixed messages, I think, you know? Yeah, confusing to the economy and yeah. to the people, for sure. Well, okay, no, no, no other uh, answers as to what we could be doing during this, this time, this day and well, time? Well, like you said, that it's important for us to uh, look forward and be preparing for that day. I think uh, it, You talked about Dave Ramsey and how, how important it is to follow his guidance in... Uh, in our uh, situations with regard to money and how, you know, uh, uh, saving three months, I think is what he recommends, have three months in, uh, in your savings account so that in for the emergency. event- For huh? emergency. Mm -hmm. For emergencies. For emergencies yeah. and yeah. for, you know, in situations like this where yeah. things are getting tight and you need to uh, dip into it a little bit just to make ends meet, uh, you know. So uh, it's always good to have that reserve set aside for you. I think, too, if you could find a good Christian financial planner, financial advisor uh, that, that has good biblical principles, because everybody can't get to Dave Ramsey. I mean, his books are terrific, yeah, just yeah. terrific. Uh, but finding a local <laughs> Dave Ramsey, if, if you could, uh, to help you get through these difficult times, um, from a biblical perspective, that, that's certainly a good They're thing to do. All mm -hmm. you have to do is look. They, are, they so. are out there, yeah. And a basic step anyone can take is just to start to track your expenses, see what you spend your money on. My wife and I have, have used for 25 years just a little paper booklet, budget book that you mm -hmm. buy from you know, the office supply store, mm -hmm. and every dime we spend, we record, and so month by month you see where your money's going and you might make a decision, oh wow, I spent way too much money eating out to dinner or <laughs> I, you know, my phone bill is way too high, whatever it is, mm -hmm. just tr simply uh, the simple process of tracking the expenses yeah helps you then make some, you then, then might have to make some tough decisions yeah. about where you're going to cut back. Yeah. And, you know, that's what Dave Ramsey would tell you to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you can do that on your own. Yeah. Uh, just take some discipline and maybe a Christian friend to help you. At, yeah. least, at least once a month mm -hmm. sitting down yeah. to take yeah. a look that's at those right. things to yeah. see where you are, you know. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. That's very good. Okay, well, let's, let's move on to a, a, another question here that we got. Um, does God change his mind? This is a question that came in. And... Um, the person that wrote this question uh, cites some biblical examples, for instance, in Exodus, the 32nd chapter, uh, where God is um, talking with Moses about the behavior of the children of Israel. And um, it certainly appears that God may be about to invoke punishment for their uh, sins. And Moses says, well, if you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out too, then, you know. 
And so Moses was, Moses was acting like Christ in that stead because he actually um, stood in the way that Christ does for us now in the New Testament. And then another case uh, where people think that God perhaps changed his mind, Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, where God was saying, get your house in order because we're going to wrap things up here for you on this <laughs> earth. <laughs> and, and, and Hezekiah goes before the Lord in prayer and God grants him 15 more years. How about that? So what do you gentlemen think? Does God change his mind? And if so, why? What are the circumstances that would lead him to do so? I think that it appears that God changes his mind. Uh, kind of an anthropomorphic uh, attitude with God that he wants to be able to relate to us. We change our minds all the time. And so uh, sometimes he uses that kind of illustration uh, you know, I know with Ahab, Ahab, uh, God said, I'm going to take you out. And Ahab walked softly in his palace and, uh, and God said, no, I'm going to let you live on. It'll be your children that'll be taken out. So, you know, like Neil told us earlier, and that is that uh, God works those things. He's already got it in his mind what he's going to do. He's not changing his mind. He's just uh, uh, being guided by our actions. And when Ahab changed the way he was acting, God says, okay, I see your humility. I'm going to mm -hmm. let you go. So, so may, it might show a little bit of God's flexibility that he's not so rigid yeah. uh, as some people like to think God has, uh, as being rigid. And, and those, are, those are great examples. And I, I would say the, the reason it seems to us that God has changed. He's changed his decisions based on what people have done, but he hasn't changed his nature. Yeah, no. there we go. And that, that's, the, I think, an important distinction. God's nature doesn't change. His decisions change based on what people do. Um, yeah. And if someone repents, like Ahab, God's going to relent. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a great passage of that in Jeremiah 18, which, where the Lord is speaking. He says, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck it up or break it down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent from the disaster I've intended to do it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom, I will build it up. If that kingdom does evil in my sight, doesn't listen to my voice, I will relent of the good I had intended to do. So God, God's nature is not changing those situations. Mm -hmm but his action is changing based on what people are doing. Yeah. Yep. It's interesting that God deals with us on the basis of our individuality, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. makes him a personal God, but he also judges nations one way and another nation another way, and depending on their behavior as well, Pastor Abel. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I think, I think in scripture we see conditional and unconditional promises. Mm -hmm. So the conditional mm -hmm. meaning, I will do this, your response is not even important at this point. But then there's these other ones where he says, if you do this, then I will do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we do have a role to play. And somebody could read that and go, well, God changed his mind. He decided not to do that. Or he decided to do that. Mm -hmm. No, not really. It was just indicative of what we decided to do with it. And so. Okay. The bottom good. line for me is being Christ-like. Nineveh became more Christ-like. Okay. Yeah. That's for so us. God didn't destroy so That's God right. Yeah. For a hundred years, they stayed. Yeah, that's good. All right, we're going to take a break right here. When we come back, though, we've got a viewer question that's asking uh, questions about Buddhism here and comparing that to Christianity. We'll dig into that in just a few moments. Uh, be thinking about that as we take a break. We'll be right back, so don't you dare go away. Bye-bye. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and uh, thank you for staying with us. Our, our next question from a viewer here. My friend is exploring Buddhism and claims that she's feeling much more connected to the universe. I admit she seems happy and less stressed than many of the Christians I know. Is she on to something? The viewer asked. Uh, Pastor Whitney, what do you think? You're, you're smiling there. What, what, what's on your mind? <laughs> yeah, well, the first thing that hit me when I read that was, was comparison. Uh -huh. She is comparing herself to another person, comparing people to people. 
And that's like comparing a, religions. Yeah, that's a really bad idea is comparing. So Christianity is about relationship and anything else that's counterfeit is about religion. So it's religion versus relationship. Since I was maybe in 16 years old, the New Age movement came into my life and they were teaching you can have a relationship other than through Jesus Christ. And I've thankfully recognized that as counterfeit because I already knew Jesus as my Savior and Lord. But it's so close mm -hmm. that it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to tell counterfeit money from real money. Yeah, you almost have to be an expert, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you have to be an expert. And somebody who is searching for a new faith, unfortunately, is not an expert. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned. Uh -huh. Very good. Very good. So it's just dangerous, treacherous ground mm -hmm. seeking anything other than relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, it's, she says that she's looking at the way her person has responded to that re religion there, and it says that she seems happy and there's less stress in her life. She said even less than many Christians have. There's a difference between being happy and being joyful. Happy is the world's counterfeit of being joyful. You know, when we accept Jesus as our Savior mm -hmm. and He takes our sin away, we immediately go from zero joy to 100% joy in an instant. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the difference between being happy and being joyful. And what she's experiencing is the world's uh, substitute for being joyful. And, uh, and so, you know, and Jesus tells us, I mean, in John 14, peace I leave with you, peace I give you. Jesus has the true peace mm -hmm. and everybody else has other peace, you know, half-hearted half peace. And, and I would say, too, that um, happiness is based on conditions, wouldn't you say? And absolutely. When the conditions yeah, change, uh, yeah, when the happiness leaves, but the joy of the Lord it stays with you even through the midst of your troubles. That's right. Yeah. Well, what, what Buddhism teaches is that life consists of suffering. Suffering comes from a desire. And so the way to avoid suffering is to squelch your desire. Now, I don't agree with that, but they're, they're, not, they're, they're not living by their circumstances. They're specifically trying to not live by their circumstances. Mm -hmm. So when she asks, is she onto something? I would say, yeah, she is onto something that could be helpful because a Buddhist is living a very intentional meditative life and that's something that american christians have kind of lost right. we you know it's, it's as, as if we find our joy in activity as opposed to to being thoughtful and meditative now uh, eastern meditation tends to be empty your mind empty your desires biblical meditation is very opposite it's fill your mm -hmm. mind mm -hmm. and, and and train your emotions mm -hmm. so i th i think in part of that question is she onto something yes she's onto something only in that it's good for us to be thoughtful and meditative and reflective on life. And, you know, that's how Psalm 1 even starts. It says, blessed is a man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates mm -hmm. day and night. Yep. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water. So this picture of this flourishing individual, where does it come from? Well, it's someone who's meditating very thoughtfully, very carefully on God's word. So... How do we train our emotions? How, how, do we, uh, how do we live in a broken world that's filled with sin and hardship and heartache? Well, we tell ourselves truth about who God is. So it's that thoughtful, meditative way of life. And um, so that's, what, that's probably what she's picking up mm -hmm. on her friend. Mm -hmm. And I would say that practice is a good practice. We just need to direct it toward God, God's Word. Absolutely. And meditation is a... Is a um as a form of medication too, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, 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 and also part of meditation is not just listening, but speaking out the word of God, mm -hmm. yes. verbalizing mm -hmm. it as well. Yeah. Well, it helps yeah. us get our perspective, right? Yes. And something you said early was she's, she's playing this comparison game. Her friend seems less stressed than her, so there must be something to this, rather than saying, where's my eyes fixed? Where am I placing my trust? And then where you were going, like we need to you know, spend time fixating ourselves on the goodness of God. I think back to what James says, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. Don't just seek to exit the trial as fast as you possibly can, but allow it to have its full effect so that the Lord can produce patience within you. 
And so instead of saying, man, this trial is really terrible and I just wish this whole thing was over and whatever I can do to self-medicate my way out or find the earliest exit ramp away from it, rather than saying, hey, God, do what you want to do within me. I want to I want to find peace and joy and strength in you and I'm going to give all of my attention to you and not to my circumstance. Amen. Well, and that's the other thing is that uh, we don't grow when we are free from any kind of trial or uh, circumstance that's uncomfortable for us. We only grow when we're in a trial because when we're when we're not in a trial we don't do anything. But as soon as we get into a trial, we start praying, we start seeking God's face, we read our Bible, we want to know what's going on, and we do all of these things to help us get closer to God. And, uh, and so we are given the opportunity then to grow. And, but while on the other hand, if, we don't, uh, if we're not in a trial, then we're inclined to be stagnant. And if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. <laughs> You're going backwards. In, in addition to meditation, there's a thing called dedication. Mm -hmm. If you go to Cairo, Egypt in the middle of the afternoon and the call to prayer happens, I, I've seen this personally. People carry a prayer rug, and if they're walking across the street, they will put their prayer rug in the middle of the street and pray and the wow. traffic drives around them. Mm. That's how much it means That's to them. That's how dedicated they yeah. are to it. Yeah. So the Bible says that as you sow, so shall you what? Reap. Reap. If you invest, you get a response, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a return. So she's, you gotta be careful where you're investing. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point. Well, here's another question, by the way. Uh, how do we really know the Bible is God's word? Very fundamental question here. How do we know that the Bible is really God's word? How do we know that, gentlemen? He has the best answer. <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have an answer. Um, <laughs> so depending on your perspective, if this is coming from somebody who is a follower of Jesus, we see in 2 Timothy 3 that it says that all scripture is God breathed. And so we can, we can take that and say, well, it is inherently scripture that it is from God. It is his word. Mm -hmm. um, we can also just look at it historically. It's been accepted as God's word for, you know, well over a thousand years. And so if that's the case, then we can say as Christians, hey, we're placing trust that like this really is. But if you're a non-believer, you know, me saying, well, the Bible says it's true doesn't exactly help you. But I think you can also look at that historical piece as well. And uh, some of the other guys had some great answers on this regarding nature and different things as well. Okay, so, so to me, that's the, the internal attestation of scripture. I mean, yes. Scripture is calling itself God's word. Yes. Um, and I would add two more lines of evidence. One is internal consistency, because yes. we see this book that's written over thousands of years, all these different authors, three different languages, and it stays consistent. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of my favorite ones to point to is this character of Melchizedek, who shows up in Genesis 14, 2,000 years before Christ. The story's written by Moses, so maybe 1400 BC. This is written about this guy, Melchizedek, this priest who blesses Abraham. We move to uh, Psalm 110, and there's this king who's going to come, who's going to be in the order of the priest of Melchizedek. Well, that psalm was written by David in 1000 BC. And then the author of Hebrews, 65, 68 AD, says Melchizedek is a foreshadowing of Christ. And so we see this consistency over a couple millennia. Uh, and so a book, that kind of internal consistency helps us believe, not that it's God's word, but it's that it's, we can trust it. Yeah. And when it says it's God's word, okay, now I believe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think we can also look at external evidence. It's attested externally. Um, there's a, there's a, a famous... Um, Tell Dan uh, inscription found in Egypt, uh, found in Israel, and it references the, uh, the house of David. Well, for years and years and years, archaeologists didn't believe, or and historians didn't really believe that the, the house of David was a real thing. Well, yeah. they dig up this mm -hmm. artifact mm -hmm. that says house of David right on it. Uh, there's another example in the New Testament with, with uh, Luke. Luke uses this term in uh, uh, Acts 17, verse 6, the, uh, the city officials, that they, they bring Paul to the city officials. And the Greek word there is politarches. And so it's, it's his word for this political official. And for years, for hundreds of years, people said, oh, Luke was wrong. That, they, that, that term never existed. He just made that up. Well, sure enough, uh, 
they dug up an artifact with that name written on it. So the, the Bible is externally uh, verified. And again, that doesn't prove it's God's word, but it proves it's reliable. And then when it says it's God's word, we have a lot, a lot more reason to trust it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We also have uh, the uh, uh, prophecies, mm -hmm. you know, that Jesus uh, was who he said he was. Uh, just Christmas alone, we have like nine different prophecies talking about where he's going to be born and, and, uh, and who he's going to be. And, and then uh, the Magi show up and they, and they search the scriptures and they find that he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And sure enough, there he is in Bethlehem, you know. So uh, there are so many. Um, another example is Cyrus when uh, uh, Ezra came to him and said, uh, here, 500 years ago, somebody said you were going to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And Cyrus says, okay. And he goes out and he mm -hmm. rebuilds Jerusalem and the temple. And so uh, uh, we see these types of things going on with the Bible and how these different uh, prophecies tell, they foretell of things to come mm -hmm. that actually come true. Uh, one that I like is when Jesus was on the cross and they gambled for his um, clothing. His in uh, Psalm 22, it's referenced there. And like you say, David wrote five or a thousand years before Jesus was born. And here, mm -hmm. a prophecy that was written a thousand years before mm -hmm. is actually coming true at the feet of Jesus. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Listen, let's, 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 uh, we're winding down here. A quick question here. We got a new pastor. This, this is the viewer. We got a new pastor at our church, and I just don't think I'm going to like this person's <laughs> style. Is it okay for me to leave my church? We've only got about a minute and a half to deal with this question. Gentlemen, we're going to have to uh, wrap up, but what do you think? My first response when I read that was, is why does the church exist? And for me, the church exists for the community. That needs to be the number one thought that I go to church for the community. Mm -hmm. I go to church to figure out how I can best serve the community. And so for me, that's not the first thought. John mentioned it might be a personality opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, for the for verse I thought of was 1 Timothy 4.16, where Paul is telling Timothy, a young pastor, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. As you do so, you will ensure the salvation of yourself and those who hear you. So he says, watch out for your character, who you are, and watch out for your teaching. So I would say if a, if a pastor has good character and he's teaching God's word, then if his personality is a little different and you don't like his uh, stupid jokes or whatever, that's not, that's not a good reason to leave. <laughs> Might be uh, in Neil's case, but other than that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to leave it in that, Joe. You don't get a chance to defend yourself. But we've got to wrap it up and go. And uh, I should let you and the audience know that if you enjoy this panel, Stick around for another whole week because they'll be with us on next week's program as well. So until next week, I'm Bill Harris for TV44. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.